English, uh, so non non Bulgarians can uh, can read that stuff too. Uh, it is part of uh, the uh, Center for Balkan and uh, Black Sea Studies, and it is uh, uh, it is funded by the America for Bulgaria Foundation, for which we are of course very appreciative. Uh, this. Uh, this event is, is, as I said, our first one. We are uh, trying to look into the uh, uh, into the energy uh, dilemmas that uh, that are facing uh, our region, and by our region I mean not just the, the Balkans but the Black Sea area, uh, including uh, Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, uh, you name it. Uh, we are very lucky today to have uh, uh, very good experts here. Uh, my uh, my friend and colleague Anders Wimbush, uh, who has been uh, a uh, uh, scholar of, of the Soviet Union, Russia, and the greater Eurasia area for many years, uh, has about ten books to his name, um, and also was for a number of years was the uh, uh, the chairman of uh, Radio Liberty in uh, <coughs> in Munich. Uh, then we have uh, Mikhail Kutikin, uh, most of you that are interested in energy would know him. He is uh, he's the, the key guy in, in RussEnergy.com, uh, a very important think tank. Uh, uh, Misha is well known to the Bulgarian public, visits uh, here often, is a friend of Bulgaria, if, if I may say so. Then we have uh, uh, Tom Pyle. Tom is the uh, chairman of, uh, of the um, Institute for Energy Research in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, very knowledgeable guy and also very important in the politics of, of energy discussions in the United States and beyond. Uh, we had uh, yet another, uh, another uh, colleague uh, planned to be here, but for Political reasons cannot be here. That's uh, Mr. Kanat uh, Emirolu of uh, Turkey, uh, who has been to Bulgaria before and, and uh, left a very good impression. Unfortunately, he cannot be here. We cannot be. We cannot uh, contact him. Uh, we don't know what's happened to him. But uh, obviously, it's unlikely to be something very good uh, given uh, what's happening in Turkey. So what we're going to do today? We will have um, Anders start uh, an overall um, view of, of the uh, developments, trends in, in uh, uh, Eurasia. Uh, then we'll have uh, Tom discuss the American, the American situation, um, especially the, uh, uh, the shale revolution and its impact on, uh, on the energy markets in the world. Then we'll then we'll go to Misha Kutikin, uh, and he will talk about the Russian, the Russian dimension of it. And uh, myself and and uh, uh, Ilian will be the moderators. Uh, we'll kind of, since there are only two chairs here, that could only be one of us at a time. So we'll exchange places. So Anders, why don't you get going? Again, by just saying how pleased I am to be back in Bulgaria, uh, a country that I'm very fond of. Sophie, I've known Alex for 40 years at least, and uh, we've met here on occasion, but we meet all over the world uh, at other times. And we try to cause as little trouble as we can, but we usually fail. So, uh, Alex, it's great to, great to be back. Alex asked me to talk about the larger dynamics that would influence energy security policy and thinking and analysis. 
uh, which I'm happy to do. It's something I've spent a great deal of time on in my professional life, trying to think what future environments look like, and I'm going to, going to give you a bit of that today. So the environments uh, in which the states of the region seek to establish and sustain energy security today is fraught with uncertainties, uh, probably more than at any time in the past. And I suspect that by the time I'm done, if I've convinced you, you'll uh, understand that it is going to probably only going to become more difficult. And this causes analytical challenges that, while are not unprecedented, require special kinds of skills and perspectives that are, in fact, in short supply. So what I hope to do today is to suggest to you where some of these analytical challenges lie and what possible alternative energy security futures in the region might look like. And to do this, let me make five points. Point one, no matter how you slice it, no matter what alternatives one devises to ensure the supply of energy, and no matter what kinds of capabilities you direct at ensuring that supply, all energy security strategies must address Russia as a central concern. Russia's use of energy strategy to shape its larger geostrategic agenda is well known, whether it's expressed through pricing, through transport, through availability, or through denial. This needs no further elaboration from me. Uh, as we all know, understand how Russia acts, uh, usually, and, and why. But the larger analytical challenge going forward will have to concentrate less on how Russia exercises energy strategies than on the viability of Russia itself. Our set of filters, our optics, are calibrated to attempt to understand the Russia we know and to conjure outcomes of the familiar games and strategies that Russia uses in today's energy worlds. Regardless of how Russia might act, we, might, we tend to think it's a familiar and, awful, and often predictable actor. We can't know for certain how long the familiar Russia will last, but we can know with considerable confidence that today's Russia will be unrecognizable before much longer. This is because Russia is in a period of rapid and profound decline. In fact, Russia is declining across virtually every measure of its power and authority, and at some point in the foreseeable future, its sustainability as a viable state will come into question. That's a, big, that's a big statement. So what are the dynamics of Russia's decline? Any serious analysis of Russia today would consider the following. First, severe and intractable demographic contraction, including an ongoing and inescapable long-term labor force contraction, a seemingly irresolvable public health nightmare, profound and rapid population aging, where the grain, the grain of the population starts at a shockingly young age, and other deep dysfunctions in the realm of human resources. And now, uh, most recently, a study just released last week suggests even the physical decline of Russians, a group of uh, people looking at uh, uh, the, the Russians' physical presence noted that from 30 years ago, um, almost two generations ago, the actual size of Russia had decreased by a considerable amount and their strength had also uh, been uh, deteriorating. This is, this is something almost unknown in history. The decline includes ethnic imbalances favoring population replacement by non-Russians, especially indigenous Muslim peoples, which is progressively and in some ways fundamentally changing the complexion of Russia's overall population, especially its younger cohort and its institutions, for example, and particularly the military. Russia's one crop economy, hydrocarbons, whose volatile global price keeps Russia at, at the precipice 
of economic crisis, while the state's dependence on energy prices for the public finance deepens the resource curse, that is, rampant corruption, which smothers human resource-based development policies. Russia today has a remarkably underdeveloped and ineffectual middle class. It has a seemingly unstoppable brain drain, with hundreds of thousands of its brightest younger generation opting to participate in the global economy from countries beyond Russia. Its knowledge production industry and capabilities has practic uh, practically collapsed, which is caused by the deterioration of both elite and mass education and the ex exodus of skilled talent. It has a brittle political system, about which we all know, with few safety valves for dissent, for succession planning, and a well-entrenched stakeholding political elite. It also has a rapacious leadership, about which we lead a, read a great deal, which takes every opportunity to harvest the state's wealth for personal gain while parking the profits abroad. One could even include in this decline, military decline, with the diminishing technical ability to produce the next generation of weaponry. I'll say more about that uh, in a few minutes. And of course, all of this is in the context of potent and, and successful competition from other actors around Russia. China, for example, Turkey in some respects, and increasingly probably Iran. This is almost a perfect picture, classic picture, of a waning power. And I would conclude by saying that the Russia we have known will not be, not be around as we know it a great deal longer. But a new Russia, a very different Russia, is emerging on the horizon, which we will have to understand in the context of all these other and new dynamics, uh, which to me are very worrisome. And of course, they are going to affect energy security planning in major ways. Point number two, Russia's spiraling down might be manageable if it took place in a geopolitical vacuum, but it does not. It will affect and interact with the powerful fault lines all around it. A brief tour of Eurasia's perimeter should heighten our awareness of the many looming downside scenarios that could converge or, con con or collide with a declining Russia. Here we have Eurasia's other bookend, China. It suf suffers from many interacting pathologies that render it increasingly challenged. Economic slowdown and financial opacity, labor unrest, ethnic upheavals, environmental breakdowns, resource scarcity, demographic gender imbalances, rapid population aging, and continuing public health crisis are among many weaknesses China's obsolete political system must address. China's defenses against a declining Russia are weak, but it's moved to take advantage of Russia's weakness with investment, loans, and promises, not unreasonably having concluded that China will likely suffer if Russia comes apart, but also to capitalize on that eventuality. Coincidentally, China's powerful economic embrace of Central Asia here, which is no longer a Russian fiefdom, suggests China's strategy for leveraging Russian possible eventual Russian instability. In Central Asia, that same region, the post-Soviet states walk quietly amidst the larger powers all around them. Russia's effort to create an economic, uh, Eurasian economic union to rival the European Union has essentially failed, having lured only Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Armenia, along with more distant Belarus. 
While Mr. Putin envisions a full political and, and military integration, Kazakhstan has insisted, for example, on economic union only. And with the ruble's precipitous fall in response to Russia's action in Ukraine and the collapse of oil prices and Western sanctions, Belarus, too, is insisting on greater distance from Russia. While it may be the case that Tajikistan may yet join the Eurasian Economic Union, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine have said no, and the last three emphatically no, by signing association agreements with the European Union. Afghanistan. As you see, we start, we'll start our tour here and we'll, we'll make our way around. Afghanistan remains less than a work in progress, having found little peace after several decades of war. It is neither a strong nation nor a coherent state. And as such, these identities cannot be infused. They can't be imported from outside through democracy building and other Western conventions. With American and other coalition forces drawing down rapidly, stability could become even more elusive in the future as the wave of recent Taliban attacks demonstrates. And so other outside influences, Pakistan, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the Central Asian states are increasingly evident in Afghanistan and few of these are positive. Meanwhile, Pakistan, right here. Pakistan is mostly a failed state, with only the increasingly Islamicized military holding it together as glue. What happens in Pakistan will be a powerful driver of Afghanistan's ethnic and religious turmoil, which many Pakistanis, even among the indigenous Taliban, see as in Pakistan's strategic interests. Deeply corrupt, ethnically, religiously, and regionally challenged, lacking a strong middle class, hospitable to terrorists, economically weak, and the purveyor of nuclear weapons technology to other states. Pakistan contributes much to Eurasia's ongoing vulnerabilities. Iran. Iran may soon become a nuclear weapons state, joining Russia, China, Pakistan, and India in the cauldron of nuclear Eurasia. No other region of the world, no other region of the world boasts such a concentration of nuclear weaponry. And an Iranian bomb will almost certainly spawn a Turkish bomb and a Saudi bomb in short order. Iran's economy sputters along, damaged by falling energy prices, although this may pick up a bit. Western sanctions, corruption, and bad management contribute to its problems. Internally, popular opposition to continued theocratic rule amongst many youth, traditional Western-oriented elites, and the business class is rising. It's hard to know exactly how, how fast and how volatile this uh, rise of dissent is, but we shouldn't ignore it. The official military in Iran is disgruntled, having been marginalized by Iran's Revolutionary Guard, which keeps the regime in power. It's not difficult for me and other analysts to imagine Iran entering a new revolutionary phase with only slight pressure on any number of possible triggers. Whoop, what happened? That doesn't look like Turkey, but I know it's there someplace. The, 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 <laughs> I shouldn't have, said, shouldn't have said that about the Revolutionary Guard. Turkey. Turkey's prolonged identity crisis has not yet run its course and significant turmoil is likely in its future. Others here today, I'm sure, will speak more to that. The coup attempt is only the most recent warning. Social turmoil among deeply polarized factions grips the state as its, as its leaders flounder, 
for a for formula that eliminates its political em enemies, embraces Islamic influences, and addresses turmoil on its borders. As we've seen recently, Turkey's leaders have juggled these uncertainty with declining dexterity, and its losses are piling up. Shunned by Europe, and increasingly distant from the United States, Turkey has spent the last decade exploring its Ottoman past, a new leadership position in the Middle East, and a strong economic and now perhaps strategic relationship with Russia. Under most imaginable scenarios, it's hard to see Turkey returning to its traditional role as NATO's powerful southern anchor and America's pivotal ally in this part of the world. And if this is true, then we will require a whole lot of new thinking about Black Sea security. None of these states, none of them, all the way around, everything, everything, none of these states can avoid the consequences of Russia's decline and some will likely feel it powerfully. We should anticipate their pathologies deepening and probably interacting. Moreover, Russia continues to enjoy some advantages with respect to its own periphery. The area where it is declining slowest, or put a little differently, the area where Russia has sought to resist decline most aggressively it's its military capability. Russia's military is not what it was, and I doubt that it's going to be so again, but it is still good enough to defend Russia's interests in its near abroad. Moreover, as other pieces of Russia's viability become unsustainable, Russia's propensity to use its military to compensate for decline elsewhere will grow. It will increasingly take risks, all the more so as its competitive window becomes smaller and smaller. Point three. This deals with another aspect of the analytical challenge facing energy security planners. During Soviet times, one could conclude, conclude with some confidence that most of what we thought of as Russia's flanks were largely immutable, so long as Russia was the dominant force controlling all of them. Put another way, Eastern Europe was a flank of the Russian Empire and little more. The Caucasus was a flank to the Russian Empire and little more. Central Asia was a flank to the Russian Empire and little more. Being a flank of Russia was about the only thing that defined these regions strategically. But this bilateral bidirectional relationship is, of course, no longer, it no longer exists. Central Europe, the Caucasus, Central Asia are now, in fact, part of multi-directional strategic forces, not just to the pressures of the Russian center, even though these can remain powerful. Two relatively new conditions exist that complicate this center flank analysis. The first is that each of Russia's flanks is now its own center. And all of them have national foreign policies and set objectives and strategies designed to achieve those objectives. Of course, some of these so-called new centers are more focused on foreign and security policy than others are. But even those we once understood to have little experience in the formulation of distinct national objectives and hence foreign policy strategies have made great strides. Think Kazakhstan, for example, which is one of the more sophisticated foreign policy actors in the former Soviet sphere. Or Georgia, who is multi-vectored foreign policy and keenly defined national interests are notable. Central Europe is of course now part of a larger corporate ent entity called the European Union with its own objectives and strategies. We can argue about how focused these new foreign policies are or about the quality of the strategies devised to pursue those objectives. 
but that these flanks are now their own centers, including with their own energy policies and dynamics, is undeniable. So the second part then becomes, each of these new centers has its own flanks. Kazakhstan's flanks include Russia, Uzbekistan, China, the Caspian states, and so forth. Georgia's include Turkey, the Black Sea Basin, Iran, increasingly China, the North Caucasus, Azerbaijan, and Armenia, and of course, Russia. The Baltic states flanks, well, you get the idea. Every one of these new centers has flanks of its own, and I raise this issue as an analytical challenge because each of the constituent parts of Russia's flanks must factor in the effects of having to deal with an aggressive Russia on, the, on its interactions with its own flanks. How can Kyrgyzstan ignore Russia's pressure when dealing with China? How does Azerbaijan calibrate its strategic assets and liabilities in dealing with Turkey when Turkey and Russia are now doing deals? How will Central Asia's flanks in, in, in this multi-sided uh, uh, competition, how will they, how, the states relate to Iran, which is re-entering Central Asia's competition, largely with Russia's assistance? How will Central Asian states, uh, certainly, how will Central European states resist Moscow's pipeline politics when its flank, Germany primarily, has embraced Russia for precisely this role? This is not to argue that everything is now connected to everything else, but it is to say that many things are more connected than they were before, especially in these center-flank relationships. These new relationships create challenges for strategic analysis that did not exist or existed only episodically when there was only one center and one periphery. And I would argue that we still lack the institutional capacity to understand the complexity of these strategic interactions with any confidence. Point four. In this, I return to the interaction of Russia's decline with its vibrant flanks. If this assessment, mine and that of many Russian experts, uh, in Russia's decline is co correct, then the center flank dynamics described here are likely to produce unpredictable twists and turns and introduce abrupt and multiple contingencies as Russia's decline steepens. I've described elsewhere how today's Russia increasingly is a player with a very bad poker hand, but it has to continue to play this poker hand for as long as possible in order to remain competitive. A player with a hand this bad, but an existential need to play it, will bluff, intimidate, coerce, and deny as long as possible. And as these stratagems wear thin, it will take increasingly dangerous risks. The 2008 war against Georgia was an early warning of Moscow's heightened propensity to take risks. Ukraine in 2013 is even stronger evidence but keep in mind that neither of these interventions, neither of them, took place at a time when Russia was becoming a stronger country, but the opposite. We should expect more of the same. Georgia and Ukraine have already had their experience with Russia compensating for decline elsewhere. Well, what will be next? Kazakhstan, Belarus, Azerbaijan, Moldova, maybe Georgia again. My fifth point deals with how the interaction of Russia's decline and the dynamics of its vulnerable flanks affect American and European interests. For me, first and foremost, this is a question of getting the optics right, or perhaps of sub substituting a new layer of optical filters for those under which we have so long labored. An example. The so-called Russian reset reinforced and institutionalized the notion that America's interests in Eurasia 
are best understood through Russia's lenses. Its apparent aim was apparently to increase our policymakers' sensitivity to Russia's articulated interests and seek accommodations where Russia and Russian and U.S. interests could be seen or expected to intersect or collide. This large intellectual conceit that we can understand Russia's concerns and, reason, and the reasons for them was little more than mere imaging, which is always the wrong point to start a strategic analysis. Mere imaging in this respect might go like this. If we had the problem the Russians have, if we had the problem that the, the Russians have, we know how they will deal with it because this is how we would deal with it. Ukraine should have put a stop to that kind of naivete, and let's hope that it has. But the real danger in the so-called reset is the underlying assumption that Russia's aches and pains could be alleviated if the United States reduced or abandoned its support for whatever irritated Moscow. And what irritated Moscow most was on its flanks. This static view of Russia's flanks flies in the, plate in the face of what I discussed a few moments ago, namely that these flanks are the centers of their own foreign policies and interests today, and that they have flanks of their own which they must take into account, and so should we. Our interest in these flanks is no longer exclusively our concern about what, what Russia is doing or might do. Yes, Russia's big. But to associate Russian strategy to the extent one can, uh, to associate Western strategy to the extent that one can speak of Western strategy with a preoccupation for only big states is to encourage strategic constipation. Consider for a moment the case of Georgia, which was unquestionably one of the irritants the Russian reset was in intended to remove. Georgia is at just about at the top of everybody's list of achievements in Eurasia for stability, democratic practice, free markets, independent media, ease of doing business, human rights observance, and much more. But after the reset, it, its image in Washington and, and Brussels plummeted, making it a kind of national non-person. And this at a time when because of the dynamics of Georgia's own flanks, it has become one of the key places in Eurasia where a variety of the West's vital interests <coughs> intersect. Georgia's position as a critical conduit of energy to Europe is, is absolutely essential. It's a barrier to a hot, potential highway of North Caucasian jihadists to and from the Middle East battlefields. It borders sensitive Turkey, restive Turkey, an important ally and NATO partner, and it shares with it a strategic alliance that includes equally important Azerbaijan. It's on the flanks of both. Georgia is Europe's borderland, its flank. It, it's part of any imaginable Axi alliance of NATO and non-NATO nations concerned about Russia's aggressive outreach or Turkey's instability. Its Black Sea ports are the borders, and borders are the entry or exit point of much of the new Silk Road that will link Europe and Asia overland across Eurasia. Its resilient and well-trained military has provided troops to NATO operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, unknown to most people, measured by per capita that is second only to the United States and ahead of all other European NATO members who, for various reasons, chose to fight less. When Russia's decline reaches a critical mass, little, stable, engaged Georgia will of necessity become part of an outer Eurasian shell that will be needed to help contain that instability. For me, it's hard to imagine a more important small state that, at the right moment, can make such a positive contribution to Western strategic interests in this region. I run through this list to belabor my point that we need continually 
to change and adjust our optics on the character of the challenges to and the opportunities for our vital interests in Eurasia that cannot be seen clearly through the Russia first optics that dominate today's analytical architectures. This is not to discount the importance of understanding center, center flight uh, dynamics, rather it's to plead for yet another layer of analysis through different optical filters that help to put the West's pressing vital interests into full perspective. American, European, and Black Sea regional policymakers must see this larger landscape if they're to make informed choices. So much, so must energy security planners. Let me finish with this thought. The need for more and constant analysis is evident in my view, but in particular, we require an ability to look into the future with some confidence that we have identified possible contingencies that might result from Russia's decline so that we can devise a range of hedging strategies for those that we believe are most probable. We don't need to possess a crystal ball to do this. The basic tools for this kind of analysis are known. The intellectual firepower is there to do it. Yet I know of nowhere, nowhere, that such future landscape strategic analysis is taking place, not in the United States, not in Europe, not around the Black Sea. And I finish with that with the plea that there is an enormous niche here for Bulgaria to fill this analytical void by becoming the convening power of the region to get this kind of analysis into the mainstream and to extend and expand Bulgaria's influence throughout the Black Sea region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anders, uh, for this very detailed and uh, somewhat provocative analysis. Uh, you didn't mention Bulgaria until the very end, but uh, there's been a scandal uh, uh, here for the past few few days after a uh, Russian deputy in the Duma uh, announced to a Bulgarian television audience that uh, Russia already uh, owns half of the country and was soon by the other half, which of course has been a fairly scandalous, Mr. Tolstoy is his name, a uh, fairly scandalous, um, to Bulgarians anyway, uh, uh, suggestion. But uh, uh, that just to me uh, reinforces that what you were talking about is, is indeed very much the business of Bulgaria, not only Bulgaria, but other, other countries around the Black Sea and, and beyond. So uh, let's open it to questions and uh, take a few minutes to do that. Uh, any questions, please?
I would leave it to the, the energy security experts to, to, to discuss the implications of, uh, uh, of the Russians owning so much of this. But this, but your question, a very good question, uh, just underlines to me the point that I was trying to make that if you begin looking at everything through a Russian lens, especially with regard to the West's vital interests, you end up with Russian answers. If you, ask, if you ask the wrong question, you usually end up with the wrong answers. It seems to me the question one wants to ask is, what strategies should the West pursue that will keep Russia engaged uh, without allowing it to dominate the institutions and the, and the processes of, of, uh, of Europe or, uh, or elsewhere? Uh, that has to start, it seems to me, as I, I tried to suggest, that has to start by understanding, for example, the Western Balkans in greater detail and their range of interactions. They have, they have intense uh, vital interests of their own, but we're not really working on those, and we could strengthen those. I mean, I, when people ask me, if, if Russia really declines rapidly, what kind of a strategy should we be involved in? I always say, and it goes right to, right to your point, I always tell them, uh, to me, the optimum strategy is a flank strategy. You, you create strength around the periphery. Uh, that has been anathema to the Americans, uh, the Europeans, with their eastern neighborhood policy and, and, uh, and these things. Uh, all these things have been reluctant to go very far. Uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, little countries like, like Georgia or Azerbaijan, uh, which are essential elements in any kind of strategic planning for Europe, for energy, they're absolutely essential. Uh, have had a very hard time getting Europe to respond, uh, even though uh, in the case of Georgia, as I just described, it, it, it has earned its place at the table in, with its blood. It has done a remarkable job. A few people understand that Georgia put more soldiers into Iraq and Afghanistan per capita than, than, any, other, than any European country and second only to the United States. It's got about 35 dead, over 300 wounded. It's earned its place at the table. This is the kind of strategy, it seems to me, we have to, we have to start concentrating on. If we don't understand the dynamics of the flanks, of the borderlands, of the, per, of the peripheries, uh, we're never going to understand how to deal with the main strategies coming at us. Thank you. I have a question in the back. Yes, sir. Hello. I would like to address uh, the gentleman uh, after his uh, lecture about uh, the, the main problems and the main strategies. I would like to ask him what about the SMR technologies? Uh, why United States are not taking seriously, for example, in Bulgaria, the largest problem now with uh, uh, diversification of the Russian gas is not only the gas problem, but the district heating problem, because here we have the centralized district heating uh, system, which is uh, uh, making very expensive the use of the Russian gas and uh, Russian technologies in uh, district heating distribution. And we, with Dr. Christopher Lapp in uh, two, uh, 2014, found that uh, the SMR technology from the United States, uh, some designs of uh, Babcock Wilcox and uh, of uh, um, uh, 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 some other companies may decide the district heating problem of uh, this part of Eastern Europe, which is now hanging us into the hands of uh, uh, Russian uh, exporters of uh, gas. So I would like, what about the new technologies, smart technologies and small technologies as SMR, which uh, I'm mentioning now. I am not a technologist, but you're, I know you're going to hear about all those today. <laughs> and uh, let, me, let me ask uh, perhaps our, our colleagues here who know more about it. Misha, you, are, you know a lot about this. Uh, perhaps you could uh, address that question. Right now? Or, or later, whenever you'd like. I think later. Okay, it's coming, it's coming, stay tuned. Uh, well, uh, I have a question that has always uh, puzzled me. Uh, the West has never uh, had a coherent strategy on Russia. And uh, 
after 1990. Uh, uh, and one of the reason was that uh, it was, uh, how to say, overwhelmed by the amount of, uh, of, uh, 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 by the kind of change uh, in Eastern Europe. So uh, adding to this what to do with Russia was too much. So therefore, it is not by, by measure of sort of willful act that uh, uh, it ignored basically what happened in, in Russia. So Mr. Putin came, all of a sudden, uh, uh, Mr. Bush, President Bush looked into his eyes and said, OK, this is the guy, went into Iraq, the war started, oil prices shot up, and all of a sudden, Russia ended up with $4 trillion in absolutely unexpected wealth. Now, is Russia to blame for, have, for this wealth? No. 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 And it actually doesn't have anything to do with the amount of, uh, of uh, power, financial power, that all of a sudden uh, Mr. Putin ended up with. Now, we are, and being on its own, uh, it basically uh, went back to its imperial sort of uh, um, uh, policies in the past, uh, because it, didn't, it never modernized, actually, the, um, um, uh, Mr. Putin was. Now, when we come to today, obviously what you're talking about is a new version of containment. More sophisticated, but it's basically, the problem is what Russia do we expect? That's one, Let, let's call this a wishful thinking but what Russia might come, because there are a lot of people that think that after Mr. Putin there would be something worse than him. And that is a major challenge because we can go around Russia and say that it's threatening Eastern Europe, um, Kazakhstan, because of its unpredictability. And part of this unpredictability is the conscientious uh, psychological level of policy making at the Kremlin, because when you don't have enough resources, you can engage in poker politics. And bluff is, by definition, one of the things that you do. So that I would like you to address this, because neither Europe nor the, I mean, you could criticize Russia 24-7, three, but what do you expect? Uh, and how do you, because, uh, OK, we wishful thinking is one thing, but Russia is what it is. And to expect that Russia would not, ha would not have its interests is absurd. Thank you, Leon. Uh, let me say a couple of things. Um, the, the first is about the nature of how the United States and Europe have attempted to uh, analyze Russia and where it's going. Their perspective has been largely that Russia is a normal state and therefore Traditional, normal analysis and the processes that flow from this analysis will help us deal with uh, the Russian issue. What I'm saying is that the Russia that's emerging is not a normal state. It's something quite different. And it's going to increasingly become different and is going to require uh, a lot of new thinking to understand and to develop strategies to contain, if you want, or to shape uh, or to cooperate uh, in ways that, 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 uh, that, uh, that keep uh, Russia going. So f the first point I would make is th our optics right now are for the most part wrong. We're still talking about normal textbook state-to-state -state, uh, analysis. I think we're looking at something very different. The second point that I would make uh, is that um, the Russia we're going to see, we're already seeing, is going to take more, uh, take more risks, some of which are going, not going to be predictable. Uh, they're going to be impulsive as ways to remain in the game and competitive longer. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that that's what has already happened in 2008, 2013, I suspect we're going, to, we're going to see more of that. And I think we'll see more of it as uh, Russia declines across other pieces of its, of its viability. Over the last uh, seven or eight months, I've held a series of workshops of Russian strategists uh, in Europe. Couldn't do them in Moscow. We did them in, in, in Europe. 
And uh, in each of these uh, little workshops, the question was, uh, how would you characterize the, the, the nature of Russia's decline? Nobody, nobody argued that Russia wasn't declining. Nobody would argue that. It was how do you characterize the nature of it? And every single participant said irreversible. It cannot be easily arrested and turned, and turned around. The question wasn't, wasn't, will Russia continue to decline? The question was, at what tempo and in what direction? If that's correct, if that analysis is correct, then uh, what one wants to understand is, at different tempos and at different directions, what are the likely or what are the possible kinds of Russian reactions to the competitive environment that it finds itself in. We don't do this kind of analysis, and we, we need to be doing it. Uh, but I would, I would say uh, unpredictability, risk-taking, uh, risk-taking uh, uh, and, and occasional accommodation as a way of calming the waters, but then more aggressive risk-taking. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the, the one area where Russia has declined the least, or as I put it, where the pushback against decline has been the most powerful, has been in keeping the military going and keeping it, uh, uh, their military reforms, there are some, still some very good systems. It, it's, not a, it's not a great world-class military, but it's good enough to do a lot of things. And increasingly, I believe you will see the military being used to compensate for decline in other areas. So risk taking and unpredictability. Man, let me ask a, a question because I have a microphone right in front of me so I don't have to raise my hand. And uh, uh, you and I and virtually everybody uses the term the West, or Western response or this and that. Uh, and yet, when you look at what's happening uh, around, especially in Europe, uh, at least some people may, may ask, uh, where is the West? What is the West? Uh, take, uh, take Germany, the most powerful country in, in, uh, uh, in Europe, uh, which used to have the most, second most powerful military after the United States. It has no military to speak of today. Not only that, but the uh, ruling government is a coalition between the uh, 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 Christian Democrats, who uh, were uh, very involved in, in slapping sanctions on Russia, and the uh, Social Democrats, who are doing everything possible to, to make sure that the sanctions go away. Uh, you have in Germany the, the far left, uh, the so-called Die Linke, which is the former East German Communist Party, which hates the United States and wants to uh, do away with NATO. And you have the alternative if you're Deutschland, or alternative for Germany, right wing supposedly, which also hates the United States and also wants to, uh, to have some kind of accommodation with Russia. So, so uh, who is the West? And even in the United States, if you look at the difference between uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats, uh, uh, certainly uh, you can't really say that we have a kind of unified position on Russia. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent question, and I'll answer it with, with two points. The first is that, in my view, the, uh, what, what we're looking at today with turmoil in Europe, uh, an unsettled United States, uh, upheaval in Turkey, a Middle East which is pretty much out of control, uh, Asia doing all kinds of, 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 uh, of readjusting. I, I think what we are seeing more than anything else is a complete global realignment. Nobody's talking about this, but we should be. Uh, old terms like the West, uh, are probably going to have to be readjusted because we are going into a period where states are going to be adjusting their particular interests and their particular strategies in ways that have them getting together with some very strange bed partners. 
we are not we are not going to see going forward the same kinds of coalitions that we have always depended on in the past and thought about in the past. We're going to see some very, very different arrangements and alignments. Uh, I, I think, I mean, the one that, that I would have thought uh, one of the most implausible, but potentially one of the most uh, significant is the, is the Russia-Turkey relationship. There's no basis for a relationship there of 400 years of hostility and, and, and uh, any number of different wars. I mean, yes, the Turks are cautious. They don't want a strong Russia on their border. The, the Russians are cautious. They don't want strong Turkish influence in the Caucasus, all this sort of stuff. But yet the two are finding ways to act together, uh, mostly on economic issues to date. But there is a lot of talk about how they can act together on strategic issues as well. That, to me, was unthinkable a decade ago. And we're going to be seeing a lot more of those kinds of readjustments and realignments as we go forward, which will uh, fundamentally, I think, begin to uh, begin to realter, uh, begin to alter, to rearrange the way we uh, we talk about the big uh, uh, aggregations like the West, Asia, uh, the Middle East. I think all of this is up, up for grabs, and we should be aware that there are so many new moving parts, and they're going to end their movement in places that we didn't anticipate. That number one. Number two is that as this is moving, and traditional institutions like NATO, like Europe, like the United States, begin to lose or accelerate the loss of their credibility because they won't act, can't act, can't agree to act. These moving pieces are going to rearrange themselves in ways that account for, uh, that allow them to acquire security, or at least the possibility of security that they didn't have before. Visegrad has, has new legs. Georgia, Azerbaijan, Turkey have a new strategic alliance. Ukraine, Poland, Belarus. These, n these new combinations of small groupings put together for any number of different reasons, but almost all of them have a security angle of some kind. All right, that is happening because the traditional institutions that are supposed to provide them with security are not considered reliable enough to do so. And we're going to see a lot more of that, a lot more of it. Thank you. Uh, let's take another couple of questions. A uh, lady in the back. Mr. Wimbush, uh, in your presentation you speak about the decline of Russia as if this is the only um, possibility. So if Russia is weak, then why does the U.S. need to surround it with its uh, lies? And second, um, how do you assess the possibility of Russia being reunited with it? with its ex-allies. Here I mean the new um, Eurasian Union and the Eurasian Customs Union. I, I have a little hearing problem. I'll yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, hear it quite well. Could you uh, come yes, a little okay. closer and uh, repeat it? I'm yeah, sorry. I, I, have a, I apologize, I have a okay, hearing no issue. Problem. So regarding the decline of Russia, if Russia is getting so weak, then why the US needs to surround it with its own allies? First question. And second question, um, how do you assess the possibility of Russia being reunited with its ex-allies and the Eurasian how Union? How do I assess the possibility of it becoming uh, oh, reunited? Oh, oh with, with your ex-allies. OK. Let me, let, me, let me take that one first. Uh, it, it's ex-allies. I assume you're referring to the, the former Soviet members. Um, Uh, episodically, yes, there will be there will be some uh, marriages of convenience over particular issues. Russia's ability to pull the whole thing back together and to hold it, even with military force, no, I, I don't think it can do it. It's not going to happen. Uh, it may uh, it may attempt to at some point. And that may be what Mr. Putin's dream is. I don't know. We can't get in his get can't get in his head. Uh, but the, the 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 idea that even in places, you know, we used to think during the Soviet period there there can't be anything more distant or more strange than Central Asia. You know, these are just states upon which everyone else acts. 
But they're actors in their own right these days. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, even Turkmenistan. Who would have guessed? A little hermetically sealed Turkmenistan is acting like a serious foreign policy actor with relations with Iran, uh, relations with Turkey. Uh, I mean, the, the, the possibility that, that Russia might try to reabsorb this stuff yeah, episodically uh, from time to time on tactical issues, I could see how it might try. But strategically and long term, I think it's impossible. First question was. Um, if Russia is so weak, why is uh, oh. the U.S. Need to well, the, the the question the question would if if people if people understand that Russia's decline is profound, its tempo is unknown, but it's probably going to accelerate. If they understand that, one of the questions they need to be asking is. Is it in anybody's interest for Russia to collapse? That's the question they should be, they should be talking about. Is a destabilized, fractured Russia, whether it's territorially, ethnically, economically, uh, militarily, is that, is, how is that in anyone's interests? And if it's not in our interests, how do we go about helping to shape the outcome? That's a hard question. It's a real hard question. I don't know the answer to it. Carson, a short question. No, it's a small comment. On the so-called allies, former Soviet Union. I worked for an American consulting company in Central Asia and part of our clientele with the governments. So, and I was responsible for economic relations, WTO, and that sort of stuff. So at the time I was there, Russia forced its neighbors in the Central Asian region not to join WTO as Kyrgyzstan did, you know, in, in 98, but to join the European, uh, the, the Eurasian Union. So the Eurasian Union will never be a free trade zone. I mean, it's simply impossible. Second, if you look at the trade flows for the entire period of inception of the, Europe, of, of the Eurasian Union until present day, what is obvious over there is that the trade is not increasing the export from the, from the allies is decreasing, and Russia is not gaining. And if you compare the Eurasian Union with, uh, with, with the European Union and the Balkans in the European Union, those countries of the Balkans, for example, Serbia, Montenegro, uh, part of, uh, of, of Bosnia, who tried to have a special trade relationship, free trade agreement with Russia, the story of the trade is basically absolutely the same. They have in place you know, these free trade agreements with Russia, and no export of these countries is increasing ever to Russia. No, the, the system is not working. Russia is imposing zero tariffs, most often, but many other barriers to trade, because it basically sees all these free trade agreements and one-way street. And it's very visible in the statistics. If, if you try to check you know, the, the WTO statistics on the trade flows, you know, it's very visible. Thank you. All right, uh, one, one last question, then we uh, adjourn to, for the second speaker. There is another one, so we will adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Wimbush, very much.